there was another teacher running down the hallway, hollering, get downstairs, it's a tornado. The bus driver uh, instructed us to get off the bus and try to make it into the school. I could see the buses going up in the air and twirling around in the air and coming back down. We had a lot of screaming, a lot of crying. People were putting the kids that were hurt on these doors. We were using the doors as stretchers. It was just mass confusion. Ambulances were pulling up. Police were there. And that's when I said, my baby's dead. And that's all I, I can really remember. From the Weather Channel, this is Storm Stories with meteorologist Jim Cantore. April 21st, 1967. It's the first warm day of spring in Belvedere, Illinois, a town of 13,000, about 70 miles northwest of Chicago. The sky is blue, the sun is bright, and 14-year-old John Lawrence couldn't be happier. That, uh, in fact, was the first day we were outside for gym class. We'd been in, stuck in the gym all that time until this day when we could finally get outside. John, a freshman, is one of 1,200 students at Belvedere High School. The building is only a year old and was built to accommodate the town's expanding population. Belvedere was at the beginning of its growth, of its real growth. The Chrysler plant had just moved in a couple of years before. And we were getting all these new citizens coming in from outside the area. There were new subdivisions opening up. Uh, there was a real kind of feeling of prosperity. It was kind of a good news town because there were a lot of things happening. 22-year-old Mike Conklin is a newspaper reporter for the Belvedere Daily Republican. He's lived in town for just more than a year and can hardly believe how much it's changed. There was all this kind of enterprise and uh, a lot of excitement in the air and a lot of optimism about where we're going, we're going to be a big town, all that sort of stuff. Mike's regular beat is sports. At 2.30 p.m., he meets with the high school coaches to talk about an awards ceremony planned for later that night. Everyone's spirits are high. There was kind of an air of anticipation. I mean, like any time the weather's nice, you know, it's on a Friday and you got the weekend coming up, you know, and you got spring fever. The spring weather has a dark side, however. A storm system is about to collide with the warm, humid air that hangs over Belvedere creating unprecedented tragedy. It's now 3.35 p.m. and school buses line the driveways north and south of Belvedere High. 38-year-old bus driver Celestia Matheson has been on the job for only two weeks, but she's already quite fond of her young passengers. Every afternoon at 3 o'clock, she begins her rounds, starting with the younger grades and then heading to the high school. I had been to the grade school and picked up the children from there. I had gone to the junior high and picked up children from there, and we were all lined up at the high school. And we were actually had our children on the buses. The grade schoolers fidget impatiently, waiting for the high school students to board so they can go home. The kids are always very glad for Friday afternoons and want to get out of there and home as fast as possible. A few buses ahead, 12-year-old John Church is also waiting. The minutes seem to drag on this muggy afternoon. We're all loaded up and ready to go out the driveway and turn on the road, ready to, to start for home. John is just seats away from 12-year-old Kent Ferguson and his younger brother Scott. Kent's mother Nancy always reminds her son to look after 11-year-old Scott, who is mentally disabled. Especially when they were on the bus and stuff, because the kids did pick on Scott a little bit. Um, all kids will do that. Because Scott was different, you know, a little different. At 3.40 p.m., reporter Mike Conklin leaves the school just five minutes before the final bell. I sort of hustled to get ahead of the buses. Uh, you know how you do, you don't want to get caught behind them in the, in the driveway, you know. As he heads downtown, he's surprised at how quickly the weather has changed. 
The sun is gone, and the air is thick with moisture. Your first thought is, well, I guess there's a big storm coming. A big rain is about to come because you can kind of smell it a little bit in the air. A big storm is coming, and it's only minutes away. A low-pressure system and warm front have been marching across Illinois for hours, ahead of a slow-moving cold front from Missouri to Wisconsin. The system has already spawned more than a dozen tornadoes, and it isn't finished. As it reaches the southwest edge of Belvedere, a monstrous funnel forms. A farmer's wife takes this photo just before the tornado descends on Mike Conklin and thousands of others. I looked in my rear view mirror and it was like complete dark behind me. I was probably maybe less than a, you know, a half a mile from the school and all of a sudden it was like a train coming through your living room. Rain's coming down like crazy. I mean, I just pulled over to the car and, you know, jumped in a ditch. Back at the high school, the final bell rings at 3.45 p.m. Freshman John Lawrence looks outside and is amazed. His blue skies have turned black. I remember asking Mr. Halverson, the algebra teacher that I had at the time, if he'd like me to close the windows. And totally joking, he said, no, you better leave them open. They might blow out, you know how these tornadoes do that. But this is no joke. Within seconds, the F4 tornado, the second highest on the Fujita rating scale, reaches the school. Winds rage at more than 200 miles an hour. The school's fire alarm begins ringing. We were trained in the school on a fire drill you walk, you don't run, but you walk to the nearest exit and leave the building, which is exactly the mode that we went into. There was another teacher in the hallway running from the front of the building toward the back of the building, hollering, get downstairs, it's a tornado. And he says, run again, and that's when we started running down the stairs. The warning is too late. Hundreds of students are already outside, boarding buses or getting into their cars. They're met with a sudden rush of hail and rain. Confused, some bus drivers order the students back into the building. Then they tell the grade schoolers, like John Church, to run for cover as well. Someone said, tornado. At that point, then the, the bus driver said, uh, you know, try to get off the bus and into the school, because I don't think anyone realized that the tornado was really right there at that point. Nobody was really pushing and shoving. People were just, as you would typically stand up from the front towards the back and get up and leave the bus. John and the other children don't know enough to panic. They simply head off the bus straight into the storm. Just as I had gotten outside, I could hear glass breaking. The next thing I remember, I was on the ground. 12-year-old Kent Ferguson is afraid his brother Scott won't make it to the building. He pushes Scott under a bus seat, then heads outside. Kent told Scott he was to stay on the bus and underneath the seat. And then he had gotten off the bus to go head for the high school. Some people did get off the bus, some didn't, and uh, some made it into school, some didn't. A few buses back at the end of the line, Celestia Matheson instructs her 50 students to stay put. I don't know which was the best way to do it. I really don't. I don't know if I did right or wrong, but we stayed on the bus. She tells the children to open the windows and take shelter under the seats. I got down part way, but I was also kind of sitting up a little bit, trying to watch out, see what all was going on. You sit there seeing this big black funnel coming towards you and seeing it pick up the buses one by one and some of them turn twirl in the sky or just raise up and come down somewhere else. And basically we just sat there and waited for our turn to go spinning in the air. I, at that moment, thought that it would be some kind of a miracle if anybody lived through this. Outside, 12-year-old John Church is being thrown around by the violent twister. I do recall seeing buses moving and tipping over and, and moving and rolling. It looked like they were rolling actually over the top of me. A piece of debris slams into him, crushing his hip. But the frightened 7th grader doesn't realize how badly he's hurt. 
children, I was still trying to get into school, so I did try to get up several times. But every time you'd try to get up, the, the wind and the rain and things in the air would just kind of force you back down to the ground. So after two or three times, I finally figured out the best thing was just to, to stay still and lay down until the, the storm was gone. Less than a mile away, reporter Mike Conklin is using the same strategy. He lies in a ditch, completely unaware that the school he left just minutes ago is in the middle of nature's fury. The scariest thing in the world is, is, is nature. You can hear all this noise and all of the wind whipping still. You're just totally vulnerable. You know, you can be totally vulnerable. April 21st, 1967, Belvedere, Illinois. An F-4 tornado with wind speeds estimated up to 260 miles an hour has decimated a grocery store, a hospital, and hundreds of homes. But the worst damage is at Belvedere High School, where the twister stops all the clocks at exactly 3.50 p.m. As the winds die down, newspaper reporter Mike Conklin climbs out of his hiding place, a ditch by the side of the road. He jumps into his car and heads downtown to the Belvedere Daily Republican. I had no clue at the time that there had been that sort of devastation at the high school. My first instinct was to, to go right to the paper and find out what the hell is going on here. Less than a mile away, at Belvedere High School, Freshman John Lawrence crawls out from the locker bay where he has taken cover. He sees the Belvedere police captain running through the hall. He spotted me, called me by name, and said, uh, get some other bigger guys together. I got a job for you. Just get them together and meet me at the front door. And so I did. We stepped outside, and that's when it hit me, just how bad this was. Everything was covered with mud. So it's like you're walking into a black and white world. And you can see these cars covered with mud, upside down, on their sides, smashed. Houses missing roofs, missing walls. Some of them were missing everything, but the bathtub and the toilet was the only thing left on some of these houses. John Lawrence and the other boys are told to look for survivors. John finds no one in the parking lot, so he runs back to the school and offers help. They had gotten some tools from the shop area. They were knocking the pins out and taking doors off, and um, somebody said, grab this door, follow him. And uh, we went out the back of the building, and people were putting the kids that were hurt on these doors. We were using the doors as stretchers. The scene in the back of the school is even worse than the front. Twelve school buses filled with children have been picked up, flipped, and scattered. Children struggle to climb out the windows. Across the landscape, arms and legs stick up out of the mud. Somebody would pick this kid up and lay him gently on this door. And then uh, we would head back to the building. Somebody else would say, you got space for another one. They'd lay another child on the door. We were running with those doors. We weren't walking, we were running. Bus driver Celestia Matheson is unconscious. She fell head first into the stairwell when her bus flipped over. When I came to, the bus was on the ground and some little girl was saying, get off of me, get off of me, you know. Celestia has a broken nose, but none of her students is seriously injured. She and some older boys help shepherd children into the high school. There was kids going into the school from everywhere, you know, just trying to get into the school. You could start at that point to hear a lot of kids either crying or hollering out or asking for people. Seventh grader John Church is lying face down in the mud, about 500 feet from the school. His hip is crushed and he can't stand. He cries out for help, searching for anyone familiar. At last, a friend from junior high comes to his aid although John can hardly recognize him. There was so much mud and uh, there was asphalt from new construction around the school that you couldn't really tell who people were. The children are covered with sores. Their skin is embedded with tiny pea stones that were sent flying from the school's new roof. 
it's like somebody took a baseball bat and, and beat the people that were there because all that stuff hitting you. Once inside the school, the 12-year-old lies on the floor and waits. His crushed hip is not the first priority when so many others are facing death. The lesser severely injured went to the cafeteria where they were taking care of first aid procedures. The more seriously injured were taken to the library. We later found out that the ones that went to the gymnasium were the dead ones. They, that gymnasium was the morgue. Nancy Ferguson is 30 miles away in Pecatonica, Illinois, when she hears news of the tornado. The 33-year-old mother rushes home to join her husband, Bill, in the search for her sons, 12-year-old Kent and 11-year-old Scott. It was raining hard, and truthfully, I don't remember stopping at stop signs or anything. Kent's birthday was the next day. And so I had all his birthday presents in the back seat of the car, just in case I found him, and in case he was in the hospital. Mike Conklin is reporting at St. Joseph's Hospital. Belvedere's other hospital, called Highland, is useless after being torn apart by the tornado. St. Joe's doesn't have enough staff to handle this kind of disaster. I'd never been through anything like this before. I mean, it was just mass confusion. People were being brought in on stretchers, ambulances were pulling up, police were there trying to direct traffic. Hundreds of victims are taken to hospitals in the nearby city of Rockford, just 12 miles away. Nancy Ferguson is not allowed access to St. Joe's. Instead, she's directed to the community center. Neither of her boys has been found. Nancy is frantic. She knows that 11-year-old Scott, who is mentally disabled, won't understand what's happening. Finally, at 2 a.m., she gets word over the radio. We heard there was a Scott that had just come out of surgery, and his name was Scott, but he couldn't tell his last name. And uh, we knew it right away it was our Scott. One son is alive, but there's still no word about Kent. It's very hard trying to figure out what's going on and what the world's coming to. And um, sometimes you even think there's no, no God. Why should he do something like this? It's just before 3 a.m. on April 22nd, 1967. Nancy Ferguson and her husband Bill arrive at Swedish American Hospital in Rockford, Illinois, where their 11-year-old son Scott is recovering from surgery. Uh, his throat was cut, his tongue was half cut off, uh, he had pea stones in his back, uh, he had a big gash across the top of his head. Scott is unconscious and his recovery will take months, but he's alive and Nancy is overjoyed. However, her eldest son Kent whose 13th birthday is today, is still missing. The hospital sends her home to wait for news. At 4 a.m., Nancy's brother-in-law calls and asks to speak to her husband. And that's when I said, my baby's dead. And that's all I, I can really remember. He was off the bus, and he was headed for the high school. And um, he was hit by a board. I lost the chance of seeing my son grow up and often wondered what kind of adult he would be and what he would look like. And um, not hearing, hi, Mom, anymore. But that's the main thing I often wondered is what he would have done, things like that. Kent is one of 13 children killed at Belvedere High School. In all, 25 people are dead in Belvedere. Nearly 500 are injured. 12-year-old John Church will spend years recovering from a crushed hip. Even so, he considers himself lucky. There's lots of folks that uh, were much more involved than I was. I just had me in the wrong place at the wrong time. 36 years later, a mural marks the tragedy of the tornado in Belvedere. It's a tribute to all those who died. 
and those left behind to pick up the pieces. If you go to that neighborhood today, the trees have grown, the homes have all been rebuilt, the high school has been not only fixed, but it's been added to. The uh, awesome power of a tornado can do a lot of damage, but the awesome power of the human spirit can put things back together. The town's weather troubles didn't end on that fatal spring day. What bizarre weather struck Belvedere, Illinois, after the F4 tornado? We'll tell you when Storm Stories continues. So what bizarre weather struck Belvedere, Illinois, after the F4 tornado? Less than 48 hours after balmy weather and a deadly tornado, on April 23, 1967, heavy snow began to fall. Nearly four inches covered the battered town, hampering cleanup efforts for the hundreds left homeless by the tornado. For Storm Stories, I'm meteorologist Jim Cantori. Your local forecast is next.